Bible, Frank was a senior. He was uh, driving into work uh, from the Chestnut Hill area, and uh, he was driving along um, what is now called the Kelly Drive. It used to be East River Drive. I think it was East River Drive, and he saw the Mallard Ducks, you know, all the ducks on the river. And he said the river was frozen over, and he said, my God, they're going to starve. So he, when he got into, the, into his office, he picked up the phone, talked to some restaurateurs, found out from the Philadelphia Zoo exactly what was needed to feed these animals, these uh, mallard ducks, and had them stay in Philadelphia, and they're there now. Uh, that little island, what's that island called, Frank? Peters. Peters Island, that little island there. Uh, they put um, um, tires in there, uh, used tires, so that the mallards could build nests because it was so windy, they couldn't build just a nest, uh, the, the straw would blow away. So if you see those, uh, if you see those ducks and uh, a geese, uh, not the geese, not the geese, not the geese, the ducks. The geese, the geese are just transient. They just come in and fly south. It's the ducks who stay there all the time. You can thank Frank Frank's old man. All right. Here's a gentleman who has uh, many hats. He's our councilman at large. Anybody who lives in Philadelphia? I live in Philadelphia. Oh, well, he represents all of us who live in Philadelphia. He is the minority whip uh, in, 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 our, in the council here in Philadelphia. Just recently re-elected uh, uh, to his position. Yes, that deserves a round of applause. In fact, I uh, was on vacation and um, did an absentee ballot. Voted for you, Frank, right? I told you. That's right. You got two votes from me and my, my wife uh, in absentee. Anyway. He's also a gentleman who received the Ayers Award just recently for having the best weekend talk show in Philadelphia on WPEM. So let's let's introduce our gentleman, the speaker today. Rizzo name for so many years. Uh, you know, it's interesting now, whenever I go to an event and uh, it's the street administration and they pick up a microphone, they always make a comment that they're speaking in the one they can see. <laughs> I knew you'd get that. <laughs> but uh, I look around the room and I saw Mark Howard and so many of you uh, that I have known for uh, a long, long time. And I see Cal Rudman and I said, it was probably one of the most painful pieces of legislation that I ever had to participate in because I thought it was the right thing to do. It was the campaign finance reform. Before, we were fairly, it was limited, uh, unlimited what amount of money that we could take uh, for our campaigns. And one of my bigger financial supporters in the room is Cal Rudman. He's my biggest single financial supporter. And when I signed that and limited it to a thousand bucks, it broke my heart. <laughs> and he smiled. He keeps, he, he's so happy that uh, we were able to uh, eliminate that uh, big check that he has to give me. Uh, each time I run for re-election. But you said you'd work a way out, wouldn't you? <laughs> That's right. We're going to hire him as a consultant. Uh, it's really great to be here today and uh, to work over at PEN with, uh, with Bill Weber is uh, a great, great opportunity for me. And I see my other colleague, Art Andrews, and I remember at the, uh, at the awards, I mentioned that I was the uh, one of the younger people over at WPEN, and, and Art quickly corrected me and uh, indicated that Andy Cortman was uh, a bit younger than me. So, but again, I'm right up there in the uh, in the in the age category. The uh, Bill said about my dad, and he probably has had the biggest influence on Philadelphia than most people in, in, a, in a long, are they all for me? Uh, he, he was a, a, a great man, great guy to, to just watch throughout my lifetime. Started as a rookie cop in, at Broaden Erie, at, uh, working the beat there, and a mayor, if anybody has ever read, uh, read the Rizzo book. Back then, uh, a mayor, the mayor at the time, spotted him as a young police officer and asked the driver who was driving him, uh, Barney Samuels, said, who's that young man standing on the corner? There? And he said, that's Frank Rizzo's kid, uh, Ralph Rizzo's kid. And my grandfather was also a policeman. He came here uh, as an immigrant and joined the police department. He was a tailor, and he, matter of fact, made a few extra bucks on the side by 
uh, doing his tailoring work uh, in the basement of their home up in Mount Airy. And from there, my dad's career took off. And many of you in this room have either mentioned the name Frank Rizzo uh, throughout your careers uh, or had some contact with him. He was a guy that uh, uh, I think his success in Philadelphia had a lot to do with the press that he got, the good press that he received throughout his, uh, throughout his career. And uh, I think he would have been very successful in his election in 1991 if he hadn't suffered that massive heart attack. And unfortunately, when he did have that heart attack, he was in a private bathroom, and his staff didn't want to didn't want to bother him, just to let him alone. They let him go for 10, 15 minutes before someone knocked on the door and opened the door. And by the time the rescue guys got there, uh, the, the paramedics, uh, they said that uh, that he was gone. But if they hadn't got, they had gotten him a bit earlier. They think that he could have, uh, he, he, they could have revived him. So that was an unfortunate, si unfortunate situation. He loved talk radio. He just loved it. He, I, I told Bill Weber a story when WCAU 1210 hired him. They wanted to be, they wanted to be uh, very secretive about his first show. So they said, Frank, we're going to take you to a studio in Connecticut that is very similar to the one here on City Avenue. And we're going to have a driver pick you up, and the program director is going to go up and introduce you to the people at this station somewhere uh, in Connecticut. They jump in the car, and they get up to the uh, station, and it's about 11 o'clock in the morning. And there's a bunch of people outside taking, a, I guess, the mid-morning break. They open the door of the car, and all the folks were media people, I assume, or people that worked at the station. There was a TV and a radio station there in Connecticut. He got one foot out of the car, and the second one, and everybody looks up and says, there's Frank Rizzo from Philadelphia. <laughs> well, within about a half hour, TV cameras, everyone. So the, the cover was blown that Frank Rizzo was there in Connecticut preparing for his uh, debut on 1210. And he used to love to drive Wilson good crazy. <laughs> Every night, the end of the show. Good night, Wilson. Where? Every <laughs> he enjoyed, truly did, talk radio, and uh, I think we both experienced changes in programming. Well, I think 1210 realizes when they look back um, that it was a mistake to uh, pull the plug on talk radio there. And then I started back in 1994 at WWDB, who you know also changed their format, and. Uh, we're limited to one talk radio station, at least, uh, I think, major market station here at 1210 now. And I think some of the folks, the top executives over there, look back, and I think they look at that uh, as a mistake. One of the smart things they have over there is uh, WOGL and Bob Pantano, who at least not just uh, a colleague, but a good good, good friend to me. The, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, let's talk a little bit about Philadelphia. And I, I jested in the beginning about the, uh, about the, uh, uh, the microphone. This uh, this federal investigation is obviously a very very serious issue in the city of Philadelphia, and uh, I think that we all look at this past election, and I think that uh, honestly, uh, Mayor Street, um, such a significant election uh, victory was a result of the federal probe. I think most of us will agree that it motivated uh, many of the uh, the Democratic base and also. Um, some people that were going to stay home and felt they, they took it very personal and came out and gave John Street one of the most significant elections uh, victories in the city of Philadelphia. So um, what's common? When they put a e listening device in the mayor's office of the fifth largest city in the United States and have grand jury investigation after grand jury investigation, there's obviously something very, very serious going on in the city of Philadelphia. And people ask me, they think I have some inside information. I don't, but I can tell you this, being around this the best part of my life, my dad being the mayor uh, of a city all through the 70s, the police commissioner before that, that the, uh, that the uh, issue is going to be very serious. And I, people say to me all the time, do you think you're going to see John Street taken out of City Hall in handcuffs? I don't know if that's going to happen. Personally, 
I think the mayor is a fairly, is an honest man. You can call politicians honest, which I'm one of. I think he's honest, but I think that I know enough about this business that unfortunately there are people around you that do things that are improper. And use your name, trade on your name, and the politician, the mayor, the council person has no clue that people are out there uh, making a profit on their name or trying to do deals on their name. So I think that uh, you're going to see uh, a very, very turbulent time in Philadelphia in the next year or so when these federal investigations and everything starts to come together. Because one thing that uh, the FBI, uh, the Criminal Division, the Internal Revenue Service, they have a lot of time and they have a lot of money. And yeah. what they were able to do, I said to a friend of mine who's a retired uh, agent uh, with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, I said, how did they get in and out of the mayor's office and plant these listening devices the way they did? Well, I learned something. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has a team of agents, both men and women, that bug embassies. So if they can bug the mayor, embassies throughout the world, they can do it here in Philadelphia. So apparently this team, they, they tell me there's about a dozen or so agents that are part of this electronic surveillance operation, that they're in and out, and obviously they were in and out of that office. and. Uh, um, one of the interesting points is that Sylvester Johnson's son, and I know he's your buddy, Cal, but isn't it ironic that he was the agent that was dispatched to pick up the bug once it was detected? So um, he's an FBI agent, and I'm not suggesting that uh, that there was any hanky tank, but uh, you think they would have used uh, other than the police commissioner's son to go pick up the uh, the listening device? But some people say maybe it would be wouldn't have been appropriate not to send them. But I think that if I or the agent in charge of the local office of the FBI, I would have sent uh, Joe Schmutz rather than <laughs> Sylvester Johnson's son. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the city, I want to talk a little bit about what I think this city is, is all about and what it needs to be. And I think that, uh, and to be politically correct, you have to put uh, education at the top of the list. But I think if uh, I spoke with my dad, if he were here to give me some advice, he put public safety at the top of the list. Did you, can you believe it? There was a shootout in Center City. A guy had some 50 caliber handgun that's shooting. And can you imagine the guy that got grazed? He must be in every church. In, he must be at the synagogue in the morning. The, 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 every, every, I, see, I got you covered here. He must be, he must be, he must be very, very, uh, um, very grateful today. Can you imagine a 50 caliber? I forget the name of the gun. The Desert Eagle. Des Desert yep. Eagle 50 caliber. An inch and a half the other way. Less than that, it grazed his yeah. head. And he's gone. Yeah. Yeah. So, public safety, in my opinion, we can't have education. We have more cops in some schools than we have students show up because of the fact that the schools are a very unsafe place. Now, let me back up. I think you all agree that Paul Vallis has come here and has started to change the direction of our educational process here in the city. When he came, I said, I think this guy is going to bite off more than he can chew here because he had so many things going in so many directions. But I can tell you that some of the things that he said are starting to happen. They are starting to happen. So I think Paul Vallis uh, really is... Uh, is the real deal, and I think that he's going to uh, uh, make a significant change here in the city of Philadelphia, because I'll tell you, we can't drag corporations into this town if we don't have a pool of employees that can read and write. I've talked to people in the last couple of years. Uh, I've, I've worked for 34 years over Pico Energy, and I'm not... Uh, one of the employers, when they were hiring meter readers, they brought in two dozen, three dozen, four dozen applicants that they wanted to hire, and many of those applicants said they graduated high school and we couldn't fill out the form and spell the name of the street that they lived on correctly. So what company is going to come here if they can't hire people to do the tasks that they need? So I think education, uh, obviously, is number one, but number two uh, is public safety in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, it's got to be a safe place, and there was a media story recently about the number of homicides. I don't know how you present, prevent people from killing each other. So I, don't, I think that's an unfair shot to 
uh, look at the police commissioner or look at the administration and say they're responsible for 462 uh, homicides, whatever the number was in the city of Philadelphia. But I'll tell you, that could have a big effect on tourism. If, uh, People are shooting each other on the streets, and people are getting killed every day here in the city of Philadelphia. And I think it's a really, you have to agree, it's an, it's an attractive place. Uh, if any of you were a fortune, fortunate enough or could afford a ticket down at the new Lincoln Financial Field, those two new stadiums that you paid for, about a half a billion, almost a half a billion dollars uh, to build uh, at least our contribution here locally and the state level to build both the uh, new facilities for the Phillies and the Eagles. And what happened to this when they got to this new ballpark, the Eagles, that they would be so successful because the turf would be better and uh, uh, something, <laughs> apparently that that part that Jeffrey Lawyer, Lawyer Jeffrey Lurie said to us in council that we really need this because we can have a, a winning team here. Apparently he was not uh, he was not telling us the whole story. Um, <laughs> they went to a certain point. Yeah, yeah. 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 I knew I'd stir him up. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. Don't get, me, don't get me started, baby. <laughs> but, uh, Pellegrino knows the whole story, Frank. Yeah. The... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Joe, my God, my, my dad and Joe go back, uh, uh, not that many years, Joe, but it was, it, was a, it was an interesting story. You talk about a guy that could always capture the headlines, uh, talking about my dad, is that um, he made a statement, and Alan, and uh, that was this guy, Bobby here, his uh, second father. It was an interesting story. My um, uh, dad was uh, talking to a group of people, and he was so proud. He was so proud because the Philadelphia Police Department really was ahead of its time. They were really uh, well prepared whenever they, uh, well, whatever they were involved in. Matter of fact, he got to know <coughs> Diane. He, my dad read a lot about Israel, and he was always impressed about uh, the way that uh, they just could fit into the environment that they were in and uh, be able to do all that they can do. And uh, Moshe Diane said to Frank Rizzo, he said. Uh, my father asked him, how do you do this? He said, Frank, I have buses. He said, I put the troops on the bus, and uh, we go from battle to battle, and uh, that's how we deal, that's how we fight our uh, conflicts here in Israel. So my dad went to Mayor Tate when he was police commissioner, and he said, I need six buses. <laughs> there are police buses. And he said, what do you want buses for? He says, I want to do training. I said, I want to be able to put the cops on the bus. And, but what he did, he put these six buses in the perimeter of where they thought that there would be trouble. And any time that there would be a problem, those six <clears throat> buses would roll. Because Moshe Diane said to him, he was the defense minister, I believe. He said to him, hit them hard, hit them fast, and you won't have a problem. And I'll never forget, I was with my dad. I was home on leave from the Navy. And he picked me up at the airport. And a problem broke out at the Tasker Homes. And they, the, the residents there were upset about something, and they were throwing <coughs> beds and bureaus out the window. And I'll never forget, the, nobody knew that he had these buses with 200, 250 police officers staged the armory in <coughs> Broad in Washington. He picked up the radio, said, car won the radio, roll the buses. And within about three minutes, 250 police officers showed up at this disturbance where it was really going to get out of hand. And I'm telling you, this is when Detroit, Chicago, uh, other parts of the country were poised for civil disorder, not in Philadelphia. Those buses showed up, 250 police officers unloaded, equipped helmets. Uh, that's, that's another funny story. During the riots that did occur down on Columbia Avenue before my dad was the police chief, that my dad called me and said, son, we need some Pico helmets to um, uh, protect our officers because we have a limited number of the helmets that will protect our officers. <coughs> we need to put more police in the area, so I need to get some Lyman's helmets. So I quick got on the phone and made arrangements for 50 uh, helmets, 100 helmets, whatever they were, to be delivered to the scene. Well, after everything quieted down, you know, they have this police review board that people were welcome to come and um, 
complain about any type of brutality or any claims about uh, excess force that the police department may have exerted. So this one gentleman comes in and he said, Mayor, Commissioner, he said, look, I know the police officers have their job to do. He said, but them guys from the electric company started. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah, he had to explain it. Everybody wanted to know what, you know, why these guys from the electric company were down there with Billy Club. But I can tell you, I can tell you, being Frank Rizzo's son, it probably was the most exciting time, especially here in the 70s, when we had the bicentennial celebration. Queen Elizabeth, she loved them. When he, uh, he, uh, they clicked when she came, Prince Philip, and we had lunch on the Britannia. Oh, talk about winding up the press. He turns the Zecca, my dad, and the Britannia is docked right there in uh, uh, at Penn's Landing. He turns around to Zecca. He says, Zecca, you think we got enough in the budget to get one of these for Philip? Well, I'll be excited. <laughs> Reporter ran right over and said, you're not serious, are you? But um, the 70s, the Eucharistic Congress down at uh, in 1978 on the Parkway, and again, the Pope loved it. He, I'm standing there with uh, with my dad, and the Pope's getting ready to leave, and he said, uh, Your Holiness, i got to tell you, we had, how many, Bobby, a million people plus oh, yeah. in the Parkway? He said, there wasn't even any crime here while you were here, and there wasn't. There was over a million people there, not, no pickpockets, no serious incidents of crime, and uh, Many times I can tell you, as a kid, I'd pick up the phone, and the person on the other end of the phone would say, Frank, and I would say, yeah, <laughs> Richard, and I would say, oh, uh, Mr. President, you've got the wrong Frank, just a minute, <laughs> ah, Mr. President, but just <clears throat> the opportunities that I have had, sure, there's times when there was criticism, there were times when... Um, my dad said, please hide the paper from your mother so she doesn't see it. <laughs> and I did that regularly. I'd get up at 5 in the morning and I'd say, I don't know, Mom, this paper guy, you shouldn't give him that Christmas gift each year. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's been exciting and really, it prepared me well. I had a corporate life uh, with Pico. Started there when I was just a young guy. Started as a lineman. Went to a, a corporate safety director's job and then the manager of corporate and public affairs and then they made me that offer that many of you have also probably accepted in your life that offer that you can't refuse at the age 50 to uh, take a re early retirement package and then um, I went to work at Ed Rendell gave me a job in the Commerce Department and that lasted for three days and I didn't particularly want to do that kind of work and the Republican Party asked me to run for city council and now I'm in my third term and I enjoy it very much in the same way at PEN we do Rizzo to the rescue we try to help people with problems and we have done that we help a lot of people that uh, just tend to come and need some assistance and it's the same way that uh, it's the same way with our office in City Hall normally Republicans the minority party at-large members that represent the entire city normally don't have a real focus. Two more minutes? Oh. Yeah. Um, don't really have a constituent service following. People don't call. Since I've been there, we've handled 19,000 requests from people because people look at that office, they look at that office and know that we're going to help them because the people that work with me there know that I personally enjoy helping people when especially our senior citizens call and they need help especially during these cold times uh the geese bill i did the rizzo's had nothing to do with the geese the mallards mallards the mallards the geese we wish we'd go back to canada right but uh unfortunately they they've uh, acclimated to this environment and they kind of like it here and uh, they eat everything that's not nailed down but um we called the deer i think pretty soon two o'clock in the morning that they're going to have to figure something eventually to do with the with the geese. They're brazen, you notice. They come right up to the roadway, and um, occasionally you see get one get whacked. Well, I uh, I've had a. Uh, <laughs> that sounds like a. Well, you, that's a Philadelphia term. Whack. South yeah. Philadelphia term. When you get whacked in history. Check, please. I think the Sopranos picked it up. Yeah, that's true. We didn't get it from them. They got it from us.
<laughs> what I'd like to do is, again, it's a great opportunity for me to be here today and uh, the website. Congratulations on that. 200, uh, 2 million hits yeah. so far and very interesting. And uh, Cal, your picture's not in there yet, so you better do something about it. Is it in there? Yeah, it's there. Uh, yeah. yeah. sure. I missed that one. Every other day. Does anybody, seriously, we have a couple more minutes. Is there any questions yeah. about what's going on? In, uh, I, I have one, so one quick, and then we'll open it up. Uh, your mom's still with you? Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, uh, 88 and sees, uh, doesn't take a pill or see a doctor. Thank God. God. Lord, and, she says, and she says it's because she doesn't go to the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice, good advice. Uh, a question on politics. Can you tell us the Verna story? Yeah, uh, interesting. We're talking about the president, uh, Anna Verna, and the, uh, the change really in her power in city council. Great lady, but unfortunately council developed into two factions. It was Jim Kenney, Chico, uh, and uh, Vince Fumo kind of pulling the strings from outside. And the other side of council, Janie Blackwell truly wanted to be the president of the council, but she didn't have the votes. So she got together with the minority. There's three of us, Jack Kelly now, Brian O'Neill is the majority leader, um, and I'm uh, the third member of that Republican uh, uh, caucus. We, on most occasions, the three Republicans, decide on what passes, that three votes is very, very significant, especially if we vote together. Sometimes I don't. And Cal, I'll tell you, I almost didn't on that campaign finance reform because I saw that $10,000 check just evaporate, <laughs> that uh, plus. And uh, what happened when, but we'll figure a way. Oh, right. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll do it in the back. Careful, this is on the internet. That's all right. We'll figure a way. We'll just make sure some of his wealthy friends help me out. Again. I'll still do your radios. Back. That's right. <laughs> the, um, so Anna Verna wanted to, uh, uh, Janie Blackwell wanted to be the president of city council, and that wasn't going to work. So what they did, they regrouped and said, okay, if I'm not going to be the president of city council. I'm going to have more to say about what happens around here. And it's unprecedented here in the city of Philadelphia, even with the Republicans, Frank Rizzo, Brian O'Neill, and Jack Kelly, we have something to say. What we did, we changed the rules, the way the rules that we govern by in the, in, in the body. And the president of city council was the one person that would be able to say who serves as chairman of the Appropriations Committee, the Rules Committee, the various committees. And minority party never, never, and they don't look in Harrisburg or the federal level, the minority party doesn't really serve as a chair of any committee. So what we concocted is a three-person committee that would engage if the president would appoint a person, let's say, to the Appropriations Committee, and it happened to be Jim Kenney. Councilwoman Janie Blackwell would have to concur. If she didn't concur, Brian O'Neill, the minority leader, would break the tie. Sounds confusing, but it worked. Just last Friday, there were some disagreements between Jim, uh, between uh, Anna Verna and Janie Blackwell on who would serve on as chair and, and vice chair of her, uh, certain committees, and they couldn't agree, so that had to go to Brian O'Neill, and Brian O'Neill did as expected, concurred with Janie, and it was the first time that the president of city council in this city has ever been overruled by uh, uh, by a decision that came from especially the minority party. So the rules of council have changed. I honestly did not want to see that happen because I don't think that if you're going to if you create a person, if they're in charge, they're in charge. And uh, the uh, uh, party said to me, and I'm not going to mince any words here. Uh, this is an opportunity for the Republicans, the minority members of this council, to get additional power. And you know, how can you not be for that? And I had to be supportive of it. Uh, I supported her as president, but I didn't. I, and I also supported. There were 11 of us that supported the, the rules changes. And Anna's going to have to, uh, whoever the president is in the future, is going to have to um, live with these new rules. And <coughs> so far, uh, it's working. And uh, let's see what it's going to be in the future. Good story. Anybody? Uh, questions? Tell us about your son, Dan. Um, it's blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's working at WPEN at uh, 
Well, that's, that's a lie was, because on Saturday he calls me from Florida. That's right. And he says, I'm all set to do the show from Florida. That's right. No, what do right. I do? Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was a good break right after the election to get to Florida. And I'll tell you, the technology, I don't know what that gadget's called. It's a little box. It's a little smaller than a bread box. And you just plug it into the, you plug it into the phone line. And it is such, it's not even an ISDN line. It's such quality. People, my boss at the station said, I thought you were going to do the show from Florida. He said, you were in the studio. And I said, no, I was on the deck in Florida. So seriously, it's called Florida, not the white pressure. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, again, it's been fun, and uh, well, yes. Before you go, uh, Pat Delcy wants to make a, a little presentation to you, Frank. A round of applause for our Council of Lawrence. stay here for just a couple of seconds. We have a couple of pieces of uh, business to conduct very quickly. Uh, we, you mentioned our website and uh, our guru. Why don't you take a, take a bow there, Jerry? Yeah. Jerry! Yeah. 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 Jerry Wilkinson, who has provided us with our two million, million hit because of what he's put in there. How many of you have not been to our website at all? Please do yourself a favor. If you are interested in broadcasting, and obviously you are because you're here, there is just an incredible amount of information, video, audio, and text, all about this business from way, way back to today, to things that happened. As a matter of fact, this will be on the website probably within a, a day or so, some of it. So please go to the website and enjoy it. Another item, uh, that's our virtual archive. That's our cyber archive. We are now going to get a real you know, brick and mortar archive location. And thanks to Frank Hogan, one of our vice presidents here. He has stand uh, up, stand up, stand up, take up. The broadcast pioneers of Philadelphia, in cooperation with Rowan University, they will be our house, if you will. They will be our institutional curator of stuff that we will be getting donated to us, stuff we already have, and anything that some of you would like to give so that it gets out of your closet or your basement. We will be housing a virtual museum on our website, but a real museum at uh, Rowan University. Now we're going to have a grand opening for this probably sometime in March. You'll all be notified in the mail about it. We want you to come out and enjoy it. It's going to be a phenomenal place to be, and we already have some great, great donations that have been given to us. Uh, one of the first big donations is the Evening Magazine program. You remember Ray Murray was here as a guest speaker not too long ago, and he, along with KYW-TV, have donated how many? Three? Four thousand. Three, four thousand. Four thousand shows that will be, of course, uh, uh, digitalized and be part of this research location. And on it they have every personality who has ever been in show business for Absolutely. that length of time. Yes. Wow. Anyway, it's going to be at the Keith and Shirley Campbell Library at Rowan University. We'll tell you more about it uh, within the next couple of months when we actually start the event. Uh, one other item, uh, one of our uh, members has been gracious and kind enough over the years to provide us with some uh, excellent memorabilia, and we have some for you today. Each one of you today will be getting one of these CDs. See Dave Custis right over there. Oh, yay! Dave, raise your hand. Ray Grant, so they see where you are. Up against the wall. And uh, before, before you leave, you can pick up uh, this CD, which has uh, uh, Pistol Packin' Mama, Lay That Pistol Down, uh, the uh, song from Casablanca, As Time Goes By, and with Dooley, and just a lot of great sounds of yesterday. So Dave uh, is kind enough to provide this. He's our musicologist, our, our resident musicologist here at the Broadcast Pioneers. Thank you very much, David. And Frank, it was very interesting to hear you talk about yourself, and uh, even so, even more so, talk about your dad, because uh, he, he, he is an institution, not just was. Uh, I know that everybody in this room has so many thoughts and memories of what he was able to do with the city uh, through the good and bad times. When things were bad, he was able to make them good, and of course, when he became mayor, he made them even better. Our congratulations to you for joining us today. We thank you so very much. Uh, we want to apologize for those of you who saw in the newsletter, you saw Frank's picture, and you saw uh, uh, another uh, WWDB, which is no longer in existence for, as a station, in the background. Well, now, of course, as uh, Bill already told you, he's with WPEN. You'll be able to enjoy him on a regular basis on weekends. And for coming out and sharing your time and expertise with us, Frank, we want you to take this and 
whenever you have to tell the time, uh, you'll think of us as well, okay? It's our logo special watch. Thank you very much. Frank was the latest gentleman. Picture, hold on, get a picture. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Frank Rizzo. Yay! Yeah.